Let's stand together as God calls us into his presence with a text of scripture from Jeremiah chapter 31. Thus says Yahweh, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Yahweh, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the pregnant woman and she who is in labor together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with pleas for mercy I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Let's join our hearts now in prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you that you have called us out from among the nations, that you have called us out of sin and darkness and death into the marvelous light of your presence that we might proclaim your praise. We thank you, O Lord, that we gather at Mount Zion weeping, but we enter into worship with joy. For you are our Father, you are our Savior and Deliverer, and you are the eternal joy of our souls. Bless us as we gather this evening, O Lord. Forgive our sins. Lift our hearts and minds to things of heaven itself. Help us to enter into your courts with thanksgiving and to sing your praise with a whole heart. Bless us and come near to us this night, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing together from the hymnal tonight, number 564, an adaptation of Psalm 72. Now, blessed be Jehovah God, number 564. Indeed. Our scripture reading this evening will come from 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you'd like to turn and follow along or listen carefully as we hear this next portion of God's word as we read um, through the epistles of Paul coming down near to the end of that collection in the pastoral letters. 1 Timothy chapter 4, instructions to a minister. As we've noted in previous weeks, perhaps the letters to Timothy and the one to Titus are the closest thing we have to a book of church order in the New Testament. Many practical instructions and exhortations regarding the care of the visible church. Hear now God's word, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and re require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have carefully followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. 
Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect, neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. Thus far, God's word, may he add his blessing to it. Let's turn now in the hymnal to number 281. Number 281, and sing together, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Number 281. You may be seated. If you'll turn in the back of the hymnal to page 896, we'll read together responsively the final question and answers of the Heidelberg Catechism. It's been our practice this year in the evening uh, assemblies to use this as our corporate confession of faith, and I think at Calvin as well. And uh, so tonight we will be looking at the last three of these questions, questions 127, 128, and 129, dealing with the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, that form of prayer by which our God teaches us to pray and summarizes the Christian life. So as I read the question, I'll invite you to respond with the answer printed there on page 896. Question 127, what does the sixth petition mean? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, means we are so weak that we cannot stand on our own for a moment, and our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that we may not be defeated in this spiritual fight, but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. Question 128, how do you conclude this prayer? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This means we have made all these petitions of you because as our all-powerful king, you are both willing and able to give us all that is good 
and because your holy name and not we ourselves should receive all the praise forever. And question 129, what does that little word amen express? Amen means this shall truly and surely be. For it is much more certain that God has heard my prayer than I feel in my heart that I desire such things from him. We've commented several times over the last several weeks about the way in which the catechism is such a help to us in helping us to understand these forms of prayer that we are taught by our Lord. So when we recite the Lord's Prayer, whether we recite it morning and evening or three times a day as the early Christians did in the second century or whether it is simply on the Lord's Day in our corporate assemblies, when you recite these words together, we're not simply to repeat the words mindlessly, but we're to reflect upon the themes or to actually address ourselves by means of these forms to our God expressing these ideas. And that's why the catechism, whether the Heidelberg or the shorter or the larger catechism, uh, is so helpful to us in helping to unpack this, to say in just a few brief words, these are the ideas that you are to be expressing. It would be appropriate sometimes to reflect upon that as we recite the words, but it would also be appropriate to take the catechism itself and as we pray through the Lord's Prayer, take the time to pray about these further ideas that are all condensed in uh, these brief lines that our Lord has taught us, one of the many ways in which the church has benefited down through the centuries uh, by using the Lord's Prayer. Well, let's turn back now to the Psalter portion, to number 35. Number 35 in our hymnal, we will continue to sing a psalm that we began singing uh, this morning and that we also had reference to last week, Psalm 35. We'll be singing on the second and third pages, verses 5 through 11. Psalm 35, verses 5 through 11.
Let's bow together now and join our hearts in prayer. Almighty, most holy Father in heaven, we come to you in the precious name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and with the help and strength of your Holy Spirit. We come, O Lord, with joy and gratitude and peace in our hearts, knowing that Christ has won the victory, that he has crushed the head of the serpent, that he has delivered a people from sin and death and bondage, O God, and delivered them for himself, that we might proclaim your praise. And, O God, as we take up the words of Scripture and sing them back in prayer to you, we recognize, O Lord, the sufferings of your people in many places. We are so blessed, O God, with extraordinary freedoms, with prosperity, with peace within our national borders such as has scarcely ever been known in the history of the world. And so it may seem, O God, at times that the Psalms speak with a a fervor and an urgency for justice that, that we do not understand. And yet, O God, when we look carefully at the sufferings of your people, both here and abroad, as we know, O Lord, of brothers and sisters who have been arrested and incarcerated, who have not been heard from in weeks, simply for their faith and worship and witness to the true God. O God, we do pray with the psalmist and with all your saints through all the ages for that day of justice to come, that you would come and deliver your people, O God, from all their adversaries, that your Son would be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and would bring justice to bear and to reign. And we pray, O Lord, in our own battles with the world, the flesh, and the devil, even as we have been reminded by the catechism this evening, even as we are taught by our Lord to pray, that we are engaged in spiritual warfare each and every day. So we pray, O God, against those enemies as well, even against our own sinful nature. We pray, O Lord, that you would subdue all enemies that rise up against your people and against the good purposes that you have appointed for your saints. And we pray, O Lord, that you would be glorified that you would be magnified in the victory that your saints enjoy through the finished work of the blessed Son. Thank you, O God, for pardoning our sins. Thank you for giving uh, to us the peace that knows that there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you for giving us so many reasons, O Lord, to live with gratitude each day. And we pray that that gratitude, O God, would call us and compel us to greater repentance, contrition, and the new obedience that your spirit empowers within your people. Oh God, thank you for the blessed privilege of fellowship in the body of Christ, for the uh, two congregations that are gathered together even tonight, and the fraternal relationship that we share. Oh God, thank you for allowing us the privilege of working side by side uh, as we minister to your people in the greater Phoenix area. And we pray, O Lord, that love and peace and unity might abound in that relationship. O God, we pray that you would cultivate within our hearts a desire to see the kingdom of your Son and our Savior built to see it grow, to see its influence expand, O Lord, that we would desire that you would receive all of the praise, the honor, and the glory that is rightly yours, O God, more than any of us are able to give. And O God, we pray that you would help us, that we might have a genuine brotherly affection and compassion one for each other, that we would pray for each other and with one another, that your good will might be done and that the hearts of your people might be more fully conformed to the blessed image of our Savior. O Lord, we do pray that you would bless the members of both Reformation and Calvin. We pray, God, that you would help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, in godliness and in good works. As we enter into a new calendar year this week, O God, we pray that you would accompany us and carry us that you would indeed empower us for the good works that you have appointed even from the foundation of the world, that your spirit would abide with us and continue to convict us of sin, to convince us of our need for Jesus, and to apply the comforting benefits of his work of redemption. 
We pray, O God, that you would use us mightily for good in the service of others and in the proclamation of Christ, that our friends and neighbors and those around us, even our enemies, might see through the witness, the continuing witness and work of the saints, that they might see the glories of your grace. We pray, O God, for our children. We thank you for the many children that you have placed in covenant families in both congregations And we pray, O Lord, that you would bless each of our children with a true and abiding personal trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would not take for granted the Christian heritage that is theirs, that they would not take for granted or esteem lightly, O God, the external blessings of the covenant, but that they would rather rejoice personally in Jesus, that he would be known unto them, O God, that they would give their lives fully unto his service and unto his will, and that our children would excel us in serving you, that they would be faithful where we have often been unfaithful, and that they would be fruitful where our own lives have been barren. We do pray and ask, O God, that you would bless the preaching of your word tonight. We thank you for our brother and for his years of labor, for his faithful service, for his clear uh, proclamation of Christ. And we pray that again tonight your word would be made clear and that your spirit would speak, would teach, would convict, would illuminate, and would help us that your people might be built up through the preached word and that we might leave with joy and with a sense of uh, serious reverence, O God, uh, to see your power, your purpose, your sovereignty, in every event of our lives. Continue with us through this hour. Bless us and keep us to the very end of our lives. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's turn now to another psalm, Psalm 21b. Before the sermon this evening, Psalm 21b, O Lord, in your great strength. This may be an arrangement that is new to some of us here tonight, and so uh, Abigail's going to play through it one time, and then we'll sing all six verses, number 21b.
Good evening. Let me turn this on. Good evening. It is uh, a great pleasure to be with you again tonight. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we were up here as Joel lay in his sick bed, and it's good to see him up and healthy, and, uh, but also to see all of you. It is a joyous thing to see the prayer of our Savior being answered as we worship together. Remember on the night that he was betrayed, he prayed, uh, Father, uh, my, my disciples, let them be as one, even as we are one. And here we are, two congregations, but one body of Christ, worshiping and serving the Lord together. It is truly a joyous thing, and uh, we are glad for this opportunity to have fellowship with you as we worship the true God. Uh, this evening, I'm uh, uh, reading from uh, Genesis chapter 39, a, f a story, a uh, account that I trust is uh, familiar to you all. It, uh, it is the story of Joseph. Here is the reading of God's word. I'm going to read the first 23 verses. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him oversee over his house, and all that he owned he put in his charge. And it came about from, that, from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. And with him there, he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and it came about after these events, that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph. And she said, lie with me. But he refused. And he said to his master's wife, behold with me here. My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. And he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I. And he has withheld nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great evil? and sin against God. And as he spoke to Joseph, or as she spoke to Joseph, day after day, he did not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household were, were there inside. And she caught him by the garment, saying, Lie with me! And, and he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. And when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside. She called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I screamed. And When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. And then she spoke to him with these words, The Hebrew slave which you brought to us came in to me to make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and, I, and fled outside. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, This is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And there he was in the jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible. And the chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Amen. May the Lord add his blessings to this word. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come again to your, uh, to your presence, asking you, Lord, that, that you would uh, bless your word and the preaching of it, Lord. Pull out of, of the treasuries here old and new things that we might grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, again, this is the 
last worship service of uh, 2018. This is the last uh, sermon I'll preach, uh, at least for 2018. Uh, we look forward to 2019. And, and I was thinking, well, what kind of words should I give to, to both our congregations on such a night as this? Uh, what kind of thing can I give to bring comfort, encouragement, hope, maybe a little rebuke? What, 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 what do we need, O oh Lord? And, and the thought kept coming to my mind as my, as my heart turned to these words, that uh, statement, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Now, I know that that phrase has been abused. I know that it has been misused and taken out of context so many times. But nevertheless, because I know God is good, because I know that God is powerful and wise, because I know that he is merciful and loving and truthful, and that God is immutable and he cannot lie, that God does have a wonderful plan for your life. Because God has said in his word, in Romans chapter 8, all things are working together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And because it is God's word that says that it's because God spoke those words to us that we really can trust that God has a wonderful plan. Even if that plan takes you through pain and suffering, disappointment, and intense sorrow. Again, these words are familiar to us, as the whole story of Joseph, no doubt, is familiar to us. But, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing that most of Joseph's account, as he, is, as he is described here, most of it spends time on his suffering, on his disappointment and sorrow. But the great news is that his story is part of God's story. Part of Jesus' story. It's the story of redemption. Now, I've heard various sermons on Joseph's life. And and, uh, typically, they're given as moral lessons. You can't keep a good man down or or how not to be a brother. Remember how his brothers treated him? Why do bad things happen to good people? How how to hold on to life when God's promises don't seem relevant? All those are, are good. You compare chapter 38 with chapter 39, you'll see in chapter 38, uh, Judah impregnated his daughter-in-law, Tamar. And compared to chapter 39, you might get a lesson on how to overcome sexual temptation. But again, these are not the point of the text that is before us. This is the story of redemption. And so we need to look at it from that point of view and understanding. Now, in verse 1 again, we see that that uh, Potiphar is introduced to us. He is called an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard. Now, as captain of the bodyguards, Potiphar was very well trusted by the Pharaoh. He was respected in Pharaoh's court. And, And that kind of position made him both a very powerful man and a wealthy man. And so when we are told that he bought Joseph, and brought Joseph into his house as a household slave, instead of sending him out into the fields as a field slave, our hopes for Joseph begins to rise, and and we are kind of hopeful of this prestigious position. Because remember, he had these dreams that uh, his brothers and even his own father would bow before him. And now it seems as he's coming into this very powerful man's house that those dreams are coming true. And in verses 2 and 4, we're even highlighted, are given some highlights of that expectation because we see here again that the Lord was with Joseph. This is a repeated refrain in the text. The Lord was with Joseph, and therefore everything that Joseph did prospered. Potiphar became more and more impressed by this faithful servant. And so he elevated him to being the uh, most uh, elevated servant in Potiphar's household, his personal servant, overseer of his whole estate. And so one of the most trusted men in all Egypt put his trust in in Joseph because Joseph put his trust in the Lord and the Lord was with Joseph and prospered Joseph. 
And if that's not enough, verses 5 and 6 tell us, again, under Joseph, because of God's blessing, Potiphar's household prospered. He became more and more wealthy, both in the house and in the field. And again, as you're reading these early verses of this chapter, the, the disappointment of Joseph being sold into slavery was being removed. The sting was being eased. Everything is looking bright and good. God has a wonderful plan for Joseph's life. And again, you kind of get this impression from these early verses that, that Joseph as actually in Egypt to bring a blessing from God through Joseph to Egypt, to the surrounding nations. However, as we go on in the text, we, we also see that Potiphar wasn't the only one who recognized Joseph and, and noticed Joseph. As Joseph grew in his responsibilities and his privileges and power, Potiphar's wife happened to also notice him. Now, we're not told anything about Potiphar's wife, what kind of woman she was. We, we can presume that she came from a wealthy and powerful family, but we're not actually told that. We don't know if she was an old hag or a middle-aged shrew or if she was some young case or young uh, showcase model. We don't know anything about this woman except that she lusted after Joseph. Because we're told that jo Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Here was this dreamboat, right? He was handsome. He was obviously smart, intelligent man. He was wise. He's definitely a hard worker. I mean, this is the kind of man that every woman is looking for. Everything he touches turns to gold. Maybe he'll touch me. And so Potiphar's wife grew in lust after him. Again, this is a little bit of a surprise because as, as great as Joseph looked and as great as he acted, still he was a Hebrew slave. You have to understand that racism is not a, a modern malady. It existed in Egypt. Hebrews were looked down upon. You can kind of hear that derision in, verses, in verse 14 where she said, he brought this Hebrew to make sport of us. It's bad enough we have a slave, but this Hebrew slave. And again, she was in this place of nobility. Slaves were below her status. You know, slaves were like furniture. You don't have a relationship with a couch, and you don't have a relationship with a slave. But again, her demands were in keeping with her position as an owner. Joseph, take out the garbage. Joseph, dust the furniture. Joseph, move this desk from here to there. Joseph, lie with me. And her desire for Joseph might have been a, a, something of an unusual thing, but again, good-looking hunks are hard to come by and, and hard to ignore. And so some commentators have suggested that, her, uh, that she had this, these feelings for Joseph because her relationship with her husband was somewhat strained. In verse 1, for instance, the Hebrew word that described Potter, for, uh, the Hebrew word is saris. Uh, literally, it means eunuch. Now, the word later on came to be used for a certain high class of noble officials, but uh, more often than not, it was translated as eunuch, and it could suggest why uh, his wife was frustrated and, and cast her eyes upon Joseph. We don't know, but, but every day she did command him, lie with me, lie with me, lie with me, sleep with me. And given her position and her relentless pursuit, David, or Joseph could have said, well, I guess, uh, I guess we can do this. I mean, no one needs to know about it. It would be our little dirty secret. And, and maybe if I do this, it would improve my position, my prospects. No one needs to know. But we see that he didn't do that. He told Potiphar's wife why it was humanly wrong. Potiphar has, has entrusted me with great privileges, and, and he has been good to me, and, and why should I... Why should I betray his trust? Why should I do this thing? He has given me everything. Everything in the household belongs to me except you. I can't touch you. You're his wife. I don't have a right to touch you. No, I'm not going to do this. And more than all this, it's a sin against God. 
And even if no one in the whole world knows about it, God who sees all, he knows about it. Now, you heard the old adage, no doubt, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And, and Joseph here learns what that means. He refused her advance for the last time. And as he ran out of the room, leaving his cloak behind her, she was filled with jealousy and rage and used that cloak as an evidence against him. She framed him. Now, there's something in this text that, that should alert us. Remember a few chapters back, in chapter 37, Joseph's brothers plotted against him. And it says there that they stripped him of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him. And they took him and threw him into the pit. And here we see history kind of repeating itself. His cloak was stripped off him again. Here is, is a false evidence that, that was used to accuse him that he had assaulted her. And, and again, he's thrown into another pit. And his meteoric uh, rise and his prospects suddenly now took a downward turn. And we may be faced with a question, are you sure God has a wonderful plan for your life? Now, it is kind of interesting. He ended up in an Egyptian prison. You know, if you're a slave and you assault your master, if you assault your master's wife or his children, that was a capital offense. But Joseph is not put to the gallows. He's, he's thrown into a pit. Of course, God's hand is behind all this. But some have suggested that Potiphar really didn't believe his wife's story. There's something fishy going on here. But what is Potiphar to do? He's, he's between a rock and a hard place. I've got to save face. And so perhaps it's best just to hush the scandal and put Joseph in prison and, and let's say no more about this ugly business. We don't know, but it does say here that his anger burned. And so once again, though Joseph is innocent of a, of a terrible sin, he is accused, he's declared guilty, and he's thrown into a prison. And again, in a very quick flash thrown down from the heights of, of a tremendous position to a lowly pit, all because of a lie, because of false accusations. Now here, the question of Psalm 73 might come to play. It might be raised here. Psalm 73, of course, is a great psalm of Asaph, and, and it asks the question, why is it that the godly keep getting pushed down while the ungodly keep prospering? I mean, I can understand why we suffer when we sin, but why do the godly suffer even when we don't sin? If God loves me and if God loves justice, why doesn't he reward my obedience? Why doesn't he reward those, those moments of good behavior? Why does it seem to punish me? Why does it seem like I have to suffer for doing good? But even here, there's a more poignant question that's being raised, and that's this. Why does God appear to abandon the ones he loves? It's one thing that, that God doesn't reward good behavior, but it's another thing when it seems that God abandons his faithful servants. And it's not just Joseph, is it? You, you read the Bible, and you know redemptive history. You know some of the great characters there. Think of David. David was anointed king. The next chapter, after he's anointed, he goes out and he fights Goliath. He has this tremendous victory. The women are singing, Saul slew his thousands, David slew his ten thousands, and King Saul grew, uh, grew into a jealous rage, and he pursued David for years and years. David's life was on the line, having to run. It seemed like God gave him a promise, anointed him, and then abandoned him. Or in the New Testament, think of the Apostle Paul. A man who, who Jesus himself had called into ministry as an apostle. There he goes around doing the Lord's work. And what happens? He's stoned. He's, he's uh, flogged. Goes into shipwrecks. Forgotten about. Thrown into prison. Why does the Lord seem to abandon those whom he loves? 
And you can imagine Joseph here in this pit entertaining the temptation to, to doubt God's goodness. Lord, I was spotless in my integrity, and it cost me my freedom. I, I was obedient to my calling, and here it's costing me my very life. And Lord, what about all those dreams that I had about my family bowing down to me? Were they not from you? Why then am I in, why am I in this Egyptian pit? Does God make promises and then abandon them? Is God a liar? Or God, are you like one of those gods of the pagans that play with their creatures? building up their hopes only to, to cruelly dash them and to crush them. Is that you, oh God? And, and if any of this is true, maybe it's simply better for me to live as I please. Why try to live for God? Why, why should I try to do the right thing? Because every time I do, I suffer for it. It doesn't seem right, it doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem just. Isn't this the very question that Job's wife suggested to her husband? Remember Job? He, he lost his, his family. And one day he lost his family, all his livestock. He lost everything. And then a while later he lost even his own health. And his wife says, if this is the kind of God that you're serving, why serve him? Why not just curse God and die? If, if God is that kind of God that, that plays with us and allows all this evil to happen to us, why serve him? Has anyone here ever had that thought? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that maybe I should just give up? What difference does it make anyway if I obey God? Because he doesn't seem to care. Has that ever come across your mind? Have you ever been tempted to think like that? If God has a wonderful plan for my life, well, he has a funny way of showing it. Of course, don't forget how Job answered his wife. She said, curse God and God, I die. And what does he say? Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Well, as we look at this Severe blow, and as our heart sinks in disappointment for Joseph, did you notice again this refrain that keeps being brought up here in the chapter? The Lord was with Joseph. In verse 2, Joseph was brought into power of his house, and the Lord was with Joseph. In verse 3, Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph, how the Lord caused all things to prosper in his hand. And then in verse 21, just after Joseph is thrown into prison, it says again, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. The Lord was with Joseph when he was in a comfortable place. And, and when his hand was prospering, the Lord was with Joseph. But when he was in the lowly place of the pit, the place of prison, abandoned, accused in his innocency, the Lord was with Joseph. What a, a beautiful statement this is. What a great refrain. The Lord was with Joseph. And of course, this is, is a, a fulfillment of God's promise. That covenantal promise that God gave his grandfather Abraham, and then Isaac, and even his own father Jacob. I will be with you, God says. The covenantal promise, I will be with you. I will bless you. Now, in your hymn books, you have a, a hymn it's one of my favorite hymns, How Firm a Foundation. Now, did you know that that hymn was based upon Isaiah 43? First couple of verses there. Where there God says, do not fear. Jacob, do not fear. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, they will not, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I, Yahweh, am your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I will be with you. In fact, ten other times in the book of Isaiah, God says to Jacob, Do not fear, I will be with you. Ten other times. In the New Testament, we read just after Jesus was resurrected, Matthew 28. 
the disciples come to him, and it says there, at a very interesting statement, they saw Jesus and some doubted. Have you ever seen that before? Here they stand before the resurrected Christ and some doubted. But Jesus, in his mercy and in his grace, he sends them out to disciple the nations. But as he sends them out, and as he commissions them, remember what he says? Go out. Be by yourself. Do all this great work. No, he says, lo, I am with you, even to the end of the ages. I am with you. When the Apostle Paul was in Corinth experiencing terrible opposition, the resurrected Christ, the king that we sang about earlier, appeared to Paul in a vision and said, I am with you. Do not go on fearing, Paul. I am with you. Read the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, it says a very amazing statement that power was given to the beast to make war against the saints. So as the pastor prayed, as your pastor Joel prayed, we are in spiritual warfare. Day after day, we are in spiritual warfare. And you read about that warfare in the book of Revelation. But, you know, the book of Revelation ends with this tremendously comforting statement. God himself will be with them. Did you hear that? He will be with you. He, Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And there in Revelation, God was with them. He wiped away every tear from their eyes. No longer any death, no mourning, nor crying, nor pain. The first things have passed away. But there in heaven, I am with you. <laughs> At the heart of the covenant is this wonderful promise that the Lord will be with you. And because of that promise, dear Christian, you never need to fear. Now listen, it may appear that God has forsaken you. It may appear that God has abandoned you to horrible circumstances and grievous trials. But you need to understand, you need to hear it. And you need to believe it. Not every appearance is reality. And though dark my road, he holds me that I shall not fall. You know who William Cooper is? He was a man who was a very tender spirit and, and his mind cracked with anxiety. And, and, um, but yet he wrote some of the most marvelous hymns that we have. And his admonition is still sound. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. I hope you see that the story that here is before us is not a lesson on how to avoid temptation. If that was its purpose, it doesn't offer us a lot of hope, does it? Joseph avoided temptation, and he was cast in prison for it. This is not a dare to be a Joseph so that your life could be miserable like his. Now, that's not the point of the story. What should you expect? from God. Well, the first thing I want to point out here is that there's no immediate answer to Joseph. Lord, why? Why this? Why do I have to suffer? Why do I have to, to be thrown into this pit when I've done everything right? There's no answer to that. God did not come down to him in a vision and explain to Joseph how all this is fitting into his divine master plan. There's no answer here except the covenantal promise, I am with you. And so what Joseph had to lean upon was the fact that though life is hard and though everything is contrary to expectations, yet this almighty God, the creator of the universe, this omniscient God, this omnipotent God, this good and gracious God is his God. And sometimes, when you're going through trials, that's all you're going to get to. Thus the knowledge that God is your God. You have his word. You have his word. In fact, you have more than what Joseph had. You have a whole Bible here of promises. But sometimes that's all you have. 
and you're never given a direct answer why this and why do I have to suffer and why this cancer and why this trial and why this hardship and, and why this broken heart why these disappointments but while there's not an immediate answer given to Joseph here yet many years later Joseph was given some insight into God's ways in fact in the very next chapter Pharaoh's cup bearer and baker was also thrown into the same prison. And through that meeting, Joseph interpreted their dreams. And though it happened many years later, Joseph was eventually brought out of prison as an interpreter of dreams. And he was put into a place of high authority, second only to Pharaoh. And so that years and years and years later, when his brothers were bowing before him, there you can read about it in Genesis chapter 15, verse 20. As, as his brothers were bowing before him in the fulfillment of that dream that Joseph had, he told them, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good. Indeed, if the brothers hadn't sold him into slavery, he wouldn't have gone to Egypt. If he hadn't been in Egypt, he would not have been made a slave of Potiphar's house. If he hadn't been falsely imprisoned, he wouldn't have met Pharaoh's cupbearer. If he hadn't met that cupbearer and interpreted his dream, he would not have been able to later on interpret Pharaoh's dream. If he hadn't interpreted Pharaoh's dream, he wouldn't have been placed in this high position that was needed to save his family from a plague and famine that hit all the land. And the point is, he, he saw only what God accomplished once his suffering was all over and done with. And again, it's true for us, isn't it? We often don't understand why we go through things until much, much, much later on. And sometimes we will never get the answer why while we live on this planet. All we have is God's promise. And the knowledge that God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, that he's altogether wise and good and holy and just and righteous and merciful and on and on. We can talk about his, his attributes. We have the promise of God. Again, Romans 8, 28. If you don't have that verse memorized, you need to memorize it. It will get you through a tremendous amount. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. If it wasn't in God's word, it would be hard to believe. All things are working together for good to those who love God, called according to his purpose. All things, your good things, your bad things. The good providence, the frowning providence. The joy of a birth and the death of a child. All these things are working together for your good. They're in the hands of an almighty, wise, and good God. But as great as this lesson is, the greater lesson wasn't given to Joseph at all. <laughs> Indeed, the lesson wasn't even learned until after Jesus rose from the dead. You remember in Luke chapter 24, Jesus had died. In the morning of his resurrection, there were two men, two disciples, that were confused by the whole events. They're on their way back to Emmaus. And there they were standing, saddened, confused. They thought Messiah Jesus would, would conquer Rome and that true righteousness would, would be brought to the world. But then Jesus was taken. He was crucified. He was killed. He was buried. Where's God's promises? Our hopes were dashed. And then the risen Lord appeared to them. And remember it. He rebuked them for their unbelief. And then it says, and Luke tells us that he taught them that Messiah must suffer before he enter into glory. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And do you not think that this is one of the passages that, that Jesus brought his disciples to? As he told them about the story of Joseph and he brought Joseph's life to pass or to light? Joseph was, was innocently accused, thrown into the pit, left for dead, forgotten about, abandoned. Ah, but he rose to become the Savior 
of all Egypt and all the world in his own family. You see, Joseph's place in history wasn't simply to save his brothers from extinction. It was to save them so that Messiah could come into the world. Joseph's life then needed to be conformed to Messiah's life and, and to his work so that we could see that suffering comes before glory. And Joseph was used by God to be a type and a shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, again, is the only truly righteous man. Joseph, as great as he was, sinned. But Jesus, the righteous man, suffered completely without any fault in himself. And why did he suffer? Did he suffer because God is unjust? Did he suffer because God wasn't able to prevent him from entering into suffering and death? No. Jesus suffered because he was fulfilling the very prophecy that God gave Adam when he cursed the serpent, saying, He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. It was in his suffering that victory was accomplished. And again, while the devil and the wicked men meant Jesus' suffering for evil, God meant it for good. And Jesus' death cleansed us of our sins. And Jesus' death gave us righteousness so that by his wounds, you are healed. That's the gospel. The fact that Jesus, the innocent man, bore your sins and died in your place, buried in the pit, forgotten, abandoned, but rose again. That gives us hope, doesn't it? And without this story of Joseph being a type and shadow of Jesus' own suffering and death and resurrection, well, it may be intriguing. It might even be inspirational. But it does nothing for our hope. Because what may be true of Joseph may not necessarily be true of us. Sure, he suffered and he was raised to glory, but that was him. And that was for him and his time and his particular episode in history. But it doesn't say anything to me about my suffering. But in the fact that it points to Christ, it gives me hope. Because again, Christ suffered death so that I don't have to suffer the penalty of, of sin. See, as Joseph was raised to be a savior. Jesus Christ is raised to be a greater savior. Joseph suffered to save his brothers from death. Christ suffered even more to save his brother, his brothers from a greater death. And because of Christ's own suffering, because of his own glorious entrance into, into glory, because he did this, united to us is our covenantal head, our suffering, your suffering, has eternal purposes behind it and in it. God uses our suffering to conform us into the very image of Jesus Christ. But the good news is, as Jesus suffered, and as he rose from the dead in glory, so also are you going to be raised in glory. Romans chapter 6 explicitly says that very same thing. 2 Timothy 2.12 Those who suffer for Christ will also reign with him. Christ's suffering proves to us that God loves us. And my friends, if God really loves us, then we have hope. His promises is, is being fulfilled. He really is working everything out for your glory, and for your good. And so you can exalt in your tribulations. You can exalt in your sorrows. You know, one of the saddest things that I, I, I look around me, the world is a, a world that is cursed by God because of its sin. And I look around, I turn on the news, and I, and I listen to the news, and I, and I read the papers, and, and I see walking down the mall, the, the blank expressions of, of hurting people. You've seen them, haven't you? The ungodly who have no hope in this world. They suffer. They go through pain and sorrow and disappointments and heartbreaks. 
you do the same. But your sorrows, your heartbreaks, your disappointments are being used by God to conform you to the image of his son, Jesus, to, to sanctify you. You have hope. They have no hope. They are to be pitied. And therefore, we should want to go out and spread the gospel. 2019, let every day, 2019, be a day of spreading the gospel. But you have hope. Calvin wrote, therefore also, in the very harshness of tribulations, we must recognize the kindness and generosity of our Father toward us, since he does not even then cease to promote our salvation. For he afflicts us not to ruin or destroy us, but rather to free us from the condemnation of the world. And so what we can go away with tonight and into 2019 is, is this understanding that the deeper our suffering in this world, the more real and the more gracious we will find Christ to be in the middle of it because he has first suffered. He knows what it is. And he's conforming us into his blessed image. Well, let me just close with this. One of my, I, I've, the, I think the last time I was here and I preached, I, I, I quoted Samuel Rutherford. <laughs> I love Samuel Rutherford. He's probably the, the sweetest pastor of all Scotland. Uh, Samuel Rutherford, one of the Westminster divines, a, a faithful pastor. But because of his stand for the, for the Lord as, as the head of the church, he was imprisoned and thrown into a small little dungeon. I saw the dungeon. It wasn't much higher than this and not much larger than that. There he was, cramped for, for a long time. But here what it is what he wrote. He said, Christ and his cross together are sweet company and a blessed couple. My poison is my palace. My losses are rich losses. My pain, easy pain. My heavy days are holy and happy days. In my suffering, I may tell a new tale of Christ to my friends. So can you. You suffer. One of the things that we learn here is that the Lord was with Joseph. We heard that time and again, not just in the good place, but on the bad place. The Lord Jesus himself, because he suffered, he understands that suffering. And he promises, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I don't care what trial you go through. I don't care how, how difficult it is. He is with you. That's my hope. That's your hope. And all the disciples of Christ have given testimony to this very thing. So don't believe the saying, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Oh, it may not always be roses. <laughs> There's a lot of thorns involved with that. But it's true. God has a wonderful plan for you. And you don't even know the half of it. How does John end it in his, in his epistle? Beloved, now God loves us. We don't have to wait we know now God loves us. And he says, you know what? We don't know what we're going to be like. We don't even, we can't even begin to understand what we're going to be like. But when we see him face to face, we will be like him. That's the hope of glory that's held out to each one of his disciples. That's your hope. That's your future. And you will be exactly like Jesus. What a wonderful gospel we have. Let's hold on to it. And rejoice in it. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you again for this great blessing, knowing that, that you are working all things together for our good. Not because we're so good or not because we're so faithful, because, Lord, none of that's true. <laughs> oh, no. But because you are faithful, because your son was faithful, and because your son suffered and died and was raised again, we have hope. We have a hope of glory because if we suffer with him, we will also reign with him. And we thank you for the promise of the gospel that says that, that it has not only been given to us to believe in the Lord, but also to suffer for him. The Lord, use that suffering to conform us more and more to that image and help us, O oh Lord, not to grumble or to complain or to whine or to fall in temptation, wondering why or, or how that you're good. Lord, let us just trust in your word. Help us to be patient as we endure that which you've given to us for our own good.
And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand. And if you would turn to uh, hymn number 425, we'll sing together how sweet and how awesome is the place. 425. What a, uh, what a blessed night this has been. In Scotland, the north part of Scotland, uh, you say, Bliana Vaur. It's a happy new year to you. Um, you know what? We can say happy new year to one another as Christians because, uh, because we have a Lord who holds our future. It may not always be happy, but it is blessed. So look up and receive his blessings. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.